Hello everyone, we are here with the VWO webinar. Today we'll talk about how to build a winning conversion optimization strategy. My name is Utkarsh Rai and I head co-marketing initiatives at VWO. I'll be the moderator for this session. Please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter with today's hashtag, hashtag AskVWO for any questions during the session. You can also ask questions anytime from the GoToWebinar questions widget. We'll take them at the end of the session. For today's session, first we have Mr. Srikant Kotapalli, who heads the product team at VWO. Those who don't know, VWO is a leading web testing and conversion optimization platform, which helps businesses in conducting visitor research, build an experimentation roadmap, and run continuous op optimization experiments. Joining him in this presentation, we have Missy McCabe, who will be joining us from New York. Missy is a full fu funnel growth marketer at Ladder. Ladder is a growth marketing agency that uses proprietary technology and data-driven strategy to increase your marketing ROI. We welcome you, Missy. In this session, we would try to help you in writing a conversion optimization strategy which delivers. So without any further ado, I would request Shrikant to take it up from here. Shrikant, over to you. Hey, thanks, Utkarsh. Uh, I'm uh, quite excited to welcome everyone on the webinar. And uh, let's get started. Um, so to set context for uh, what I'm about to talk uh, for this uh, session, I, I wanted to take this data point from a report from eConsultancy. So one of the questions that they asked their respondents was, uh, what's the most commonly used methods for uh, optimizing conversion rates? And this is how the responses look like. So as you can see, A-B testing seems to be one of the predominant or the preferred ways to optimize conversion rates. And uh, for those of who, uh, you who are joining us today and uh, are not familiar with A-B testing, so a quick definition of what A-B testing is. So essentially in the most simplest forms, A-B testing is comparing two versions of a web page to see which version performs better for a defined conversion goal. And the key here is uh, that conversion goal that we're talking about. So for example, say you're an e-commerce website and uh, maybe you're trying to optimize the revenue from your website or maybe you're trying to optimize the add to carts or maybe you're trying to optimize the product views. And say if you are a SaaS company like us, then you're probably trying to optimize uh, free trial signups or uh, uh, paid subscriptions on your website. So no matter what your goal is, A-B testing like really helps you uh, test different versions and then figure out what's the optimal one that's giving you highest ROI. So while A-B testing uh, as a tool is very effective uh, to help you uh, increase your conversion rates, it's just one step in the entire conversion optimization process. And if you look at um, uh, multiple frameworks and processes that are prescribed by expert practitioners, you'll, you'll pretty much notice that uh, all of them could be aggregated into like four simple steps and those would be say if the first step would be research which is essentially trying to understand your Vista behavior. The second step would be once you have a good understanding of your Vista behavior, you've uh, synthesized your uh, observations, then you try to hypothesize as to uh, what are the problems or what are the ideas that I can test. And once you hypothesize then you start prioritizing the ideas that you want to test and uh, make best use of your time. and Finally, you will actually test and learn from individual experiments that you run, winner or a failure, doesn't matter. So given this sort of a context of like the simplified uh, optimization process, what we'll be doing today is uh, I'll be uh, covering uh, some of the techniques to do uh, quality research, how do you hypothesize, how do you prioritize. And then Missy uh, from Ladder would uh, actually be covering the last section around uh, what sort of metrics do you optimize, uh, how do you look at funnel analysis, how do you learn from individual tests that you run. So let's get started with the, the techniques for research. So we conducted this survey with our enterprise customers and we asked them this question as to what most commonly used methods do they use to generate user insights. And as you can see on the y-axis we have value of insights, which is essentially how valuable that tool is. And uh, on the x-axis, you can see how difficult is it to generate insights from that tool. I think we surveyed around uh, uh, 12 uh, methods, and this is how they look like. So you have heat maps, you have uh, session replays, you have customer interviews, 
surveys, uh, web analytics, user testing, expert reviews, click testing, uh, five second test and card sorting or tree testing. So I think that's about the methods that we uh, sort of surveyed and the size of the bubble indicates how popular uh, were any of these methods with the respondents. And if I just recap here, and if you were to look at this first quadrant, so you see that uh, largely uh, the respondents felt that these were those tools uh, which are relatively high in terms of the value of insight that they generate and also relatively easy to generate insights from. So we'll jump into all of these uh, tools in uh, details in the coming few slides. And uh, first up is heuristic analysis or expert reviews. So basically heuristic analysis is evaluation by um, a usability expert typically who tries to put himself in the shoes of your uh, prospective customers and tries to understand what are the potential conversion barriers. So for example, we uh, did this uh, for one of our uh, e-commerce customers and as you can see there are uh, uh, multiple suggestions made on this page. One of the suggestions being uh, a price which is a key uh, data point to make decision on a product view uh, has not been given enough emphasis here. And similarly, there are uh, comments around uh, the visual hierarchy, the usability, the social sharing buttons. So this is how a typical uh, expert review or a heuristic analysis would look like. So it's a quick uh, and uh, a cheap way of getting uh, insights uh, for your uh, website. The next tool that I'll talk about is heat map, which helps you understand uh, how do visitors click on your uh, website? So uh, in this example, one of our customers uh, had this landing page to drive a mobile app install. And when they noticed the heat map, they could see that there were uh, uh, quite a few clicks on the top left uh, navigation bar. And given the goal of this page was to actually uh, convert users by uh, making an app install, the navigation bar did not really like serve any purpose. So that's like a potential conversion barrier that came up from heat map and they can use it to uh, uh, better their page. Next up is scroll map and uh, very similar to a heat map but it uh, helps you understand the scroll patterns and think of it more like a in page funnel. So it gives you a sense as to if you're looking at a, a single page then how far down are your visitors scrolling, uh, where do they drop off, where do they engage. So it gives you a good holistic view. Again, an example from uh, our own website, uh, vwo.com. So uh, we did uh, run scroll maps on our pricing page. And this is what we noticed that uh, in this section uh, where we talk about uh, the features that are included uh, in each of the plans, there's a sharp drop off of around 40 percentage points here, which means that uh, no matter what uh, sort of content we had beneath this fold, they could have been rendered ineffective, right? Because not a lot of users are getting to that uh, point. So scroll maps helps you understand where the problem areas are and can you look at like some form of reorganizing your content to keep your uh, uh, visitors engaged much more through the page. Next up is session replays and uh, session replays, uh, again, a very handy tool uh, to understand where your visitors are clicking, where, how do visitors uh, say navigate through your funnel, where do they abandon your site, uh, where are they spending a lot of time. Pretty much every interaction that you can think of gets recorded in a session replay and all that without actually distracting your visitors from their primary goal which is say to buy from your website or to subscribe to your website, whatever their goal might be. So I have an example of uh, a session replay, let me play that and I'll walk you through that uh, session replay. So as uh, you can see, this is a pricing page again from our website and uh, you can see the red trail uh, following the mouse path of the visitor. He seems to be uh, looking at some of these features which, which seems like a proxy of uh, his engagement with this page. And uh, when you see that uh, say visitors are pausing somewhere, then it's probably uh, they're either confused or they're engaging with that content. And uh, say when they are uh, randomly scrolling through, then that's probably when they're skimming content. So if you look at a sizable number of recordings, then uh, you'll pretty soon 
uh, arrive at these patterns that will help you understand uh, uh, what's your uh, visitors uh, intent and motivation on each of your uh, pages and that can help you like generate a few ideas around testing surveys uh, or on site triggered surveys are another very effective tool uh, to understand what sort of um, uh, intent do visitors have on your website or what distracts them or what uh, motivates them so for example let's say you wanted to understand uh, the word of mouth effect on your traffic traffic so you could ask questions like hey do you remember where you first got to know about us or let's say you wanted to understand why are uh, visitors abandoning your website so you could ask uh, a question something like what almost stopped you from buying today and you could trigger it uh, based on the exit intent so you surveys are quite powerful in 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 terms that uh, they give you triggers triggers could be anything like uh, how much time do uh, a visitor spend in uh, one of the pages uh, how far down have they scrolled or any sort of custom trigger that you can think of and then ask that uh, right question at that uh, right time So another interesting uh, tool that has been uh, uh, used by a lot of uh, companies who have uh, forms could be e-commerce on checkout or SaaS on uh, free trial subscriptions. And what form analytics, um, how do they differ from traditional analytics is that uh, they give you much more data beyond like say uh, the users that converted or the users didn't convert. So it actually gives you data around uh, every single form feed and then that could be used to actually optimize which form fields do you keep on the form, which form fields do you edit, which form fields can you get rid of. So uh, I'm again taking an example of uh, one of the free trial uh, uh, forms that we have and when we ran form analytics this is the sort of data that we saw on each of the form fields. So for example in the first field uh, we noticed that uh, almost 80 percent of the time spent on this form was actually being spent on this one single field. When we look at the password field, we saw that uh, more than a quarter of our users were actually refilling the field. So learning for us is maybe uh, we make the instructions more clear, have some dynamic password validation or uh, help them understand better so that they don't have to refill. Then when we uh, noticed uh, the phone number field, uh, we saw that uh, on an average, a user hesitated for 10.3 seconds before giving us this data. So again, this could be because um, we could explain how we use this number, uh, privacy concerns, and number of things which could be experimented on. And similarly, uh, when we look at uh, what is your average monthly traffic field, so around 20% of the visitors actually drop off on this field. So maybe there are ways to optimize this field, again, explain why we're taking this. So maybe we can increase the the uh, conversion rate of the users actually moving to the submit button. So this is how a form analytics can actually give you a lot more details, uh, very granular details on how you can optimize every single field. And uh, the last technique that I uh, wanted to talk about was uh, a five second test. So basically what you do in a five second test is show someone a page for uh, five seconds and then the page goes off and you ask them a question as to uh, any any sort of question which you wanted to really understand and some of the major questions that people generally ask are uh, in the range of trying to understand whether your visitors are getting the desired messaging or uh, desired uh, sort of value prop that you wanted to convey. So for example, I uh, took one of our uh, competitors page here and uh, they uh, sell uh, similar solutions to us like say heat maps, recordings or uh, form analytics, a lot of visual analytics. And uh, when I took this home page, I uh, did a five second test, asked this question as to, hey, what solution do you think are they selling? And this is how the responses look like. So you can see the major themes are services, analytics, software, cloud. So again, it's up to you to judge whether this was the intended messaging, but it's a very quick and easy way to uh, figure out whether your prospective customers are connecting with your website in, in the way that you desire. So those were the sort of uh, techniques that you could use. Obviously, these are not uh, limited. There are uh, tons of other techniques too. Uh, there are uh, techniques around uh, user interviews. There are uh, 
uh, usability testing. But any sort of research technique that you use, uh, the next step that you really land on is uh, trying to condense all the learnings from these uh, research that you've done. So essentially it's about that stage where you hypothesize a problem and then hypothesize a solution that you want to uh, put in place to solve that problem. So let's look at how building a structured hypothesis would look like. So um, any hypothesis, I mean, again, there are multiple frameworks out there, but this is one framework that we use. And uh, there are five components to this hypothesis. So it looks something like based on observations. I believe solution will address problem for audience and impact goal by certain uplift person. Now, quite a few of these components might be uh, self-explanatory, but I just wanted to emphasize a couple of them here. So observations, obviously all of the evidence or research that you've collected in the earlier stage. So this forms the basis of identifying a pattern or a problem that you think has to be solved on your uh, website. Uh, audience, so let's say if you're just start, uh, starting to test, then audience in all probability would just be your entire website or maybe some of your major segments. But let's say as your testing program starts to mature and uh, you'll notice that almost certainly not every idea is a good fit for every segment. And that's when you get into testing uh, ideas very specific to different segments. And you might run multiple tests on your website catered to multiple segments with multiple hypotheses. And the last section which talks about uh, uh, how you want to impact a goal and the uplift person. Now, this might sound a little subjective, but this is uh, where uh, it helps you bring in a little accountability as to what your testing program is intending to achieve. And obviously, as, as and when your uh, testing program matures, then you get better at uh, um, uh, removing the subjectivity from predicting an uplift. So once you've, you're done with your research, you're uh, done with building hypotheses, the next stage is to actually prioritize these hypotheses. And why do I feel prioritization is important? Again, we, we, did, it, uh, we did this uh, survey with our enterprise customers and uh, we asked this question as to what percentage of ideas do you test from your backlog? So uh, this is how the result looks like. And as you can see, more than 50% of the customers uh, are obviously not able to test more than 50% of the backlog. So there are always going to be more ideas than you can actually test. And that's where prioritization becomes really key because if you want to make the max maximum out of your testing program, then you better test the ideas which will really um, are the most probable in terms of uh, winning and like giving you some learnings. So if you were to look at frameworks to prioritize hypotheses, again, uh, a lot of frameworks out there uh, by experts and practitioners. So the Pi framework by Wider Funnel, the Time Impact Resources by Brian Eisenberg, Impact Competencies by Sean Ellis, and BXL Model by CXL. Uh, again, this is definitely not a limited list. Uh, there are a lot of other frameworks too. But I just wanted to talk about one uh, simple framework that we use uh, within our product. And it has three uh, metrics to it. The first metric is confidence. So essentially how confident are you of achieving the uplift in conversion rate? So the confidence would generally be high uh, if you have uh, one of these two, whether you have high quality research from your step one and uh, or you have uh, a mature testing program, which is uh, gotten used to like predicting the winning test in a much better way. And the second metric is importance, which is essentially how valuable is the audience that you are testing for. So for example, uh, a test conducted on bottom of the funnel could be more important than a test on the top of the funnel, but not a hard and fast rule. I mean, it really depends on your business. Uh, are you uh, pushing in more traffic on the top of the funnel? Are you trying to convert a lot of the last mile users? So it, it really depends on your business, but it's important to understand uh, which ideas that you're testing for and which audience are like, really important. And the last metric is ease, which is essentially how easy is it to implement this test. And when you're thinking about ease, don't just think about say the effort for design or dev, but also take into account how easy is it to get all these 
uh, stakeholders to agree to a certain idea. So for example, let's say you're uh, making some changes to the checkout card, then I'm sure a lot of stakeholders would get involved and the decision making might not be as fast as it could be for some of the other uh, low hanging fruits. So given that sort of uh, metrics, it's, it's really important that you look at the ideas that you have and uh, ensure that you're testing the right ideas to get the maximum out of your uh, testing program. So having said that, uh, we covered uh, the different techniques for research, we covered how to hypothesize, uh, we covered how to prioritize the hypothesis. And the next step is really to understand uh, what sort of metrics are you testing, how do you test, what tests work for different industries and that's where uh, Missy would uh, take you through the rest of the uh, uh, session today and over to you Messi. Hey, thanks Srikant. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm going to go with yes. Um, okay, yeah, so now that Srikant has taken us through some of the tools um, and best practices for your CRO strategy, um, so my background at Ladder, we are a digital agency and everything we do is focused on having a strong analytical foundation before going into testing. So I want to go over um, some best practices for a strong analysis. Okay, so first step in conducting an analysis of your business, figure out what metrics matter most to you. So. For instance, if you are a software company and you are generating leads to send to your sales team, like the screenshot on the right-hand side, you might have a really different strategy and approach to testing than would an e-commerce business, like the screenshot on the lower left of this slide. Um, so having a really tight tracking setup and an understanding of what metrics you're looking to move the needle on is going to be your foundation here. We also had a question come in in advance of the presentation today about um, coming up with a CRO strategy for a service business. So something I just wanted to quickly touch on there, even if you, for instance, we've had clients at Ladder, we had one that was a local salon. Um, so not something that seems that easily trackable, but even with something like that, you could track um, on your website, someone clicking on a button to call you um, or clicking on an email button to send an email to your business. So no matter what it is, just understanding what metrics you're looking to move the needle on is super important. Next, how do you go about figuring out all of these data points you're going to want to look at? So we love Google Analytics. Um, you should definitely have that installed on your website and set up with goals for all of those conversion actions you're looking for a user to take. And then I just wanted to go over a few key points. Um, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by all of the data available to you, um, which is a great thing that we have so much of it, but really helpful to focus on the points that are going to be most important and most impactful. So a few things I would suggest always looking at are, first of all, Analyzing your full funnel for key areas of drop-off, especially important for anything where there's multiple stages. So like an e-commerce company, um, you're going to have people viewing the site. Some will then view a product. Some will add to cart. So figuring out where exactly people are dropping off in your process using some of those tools that Srikant was touching on and also your GA data is going to be really huge. Um, next, understanding where your traffic is coming from and also where they're landing. So if you're driving a lot of traffic from, for instance, a paid search campaign on Google AdWords, that might be a different type of visitor than someone coming um, organically to your website or through some other source. So that can be really important to understanding what kind of experience you want to create depending on who these people are. Then where do most people land? So um, Figuring out which pages have the most traffic can be really important for identifying which pages you want to run a test on. Um, next, I always suggest looking at mobile versus desktop performance. Um, obviously, your experience will be really different on a phone versus a desktop computer, so that can be one where you'll see a huge difference in performance on different devices. Next, just some screenshots pulled from Google Analytics. So, this is an example of an e-commerce brand, uh, just to sort of highlight why it's so important to understand. In this screenshot, you can see um, if we just look at our conversion rate, it's a 0.76% conversion rate to purchasing, but what's really going to help you pick those 
very strong types of tests um, and prioritize is understanding where people are dropping off. So here, for instance, really interesting that we see half of sessions viewing a product, but only 3% adding an item to their cart. So this is one where then you can start to narrow down the types of tests from your backlog to say, um, let's focus on getting more ads to cart and make that the goal of one of your tests. Next, to point out sort of identifying key pages, you're going to want to prioritize tests based on traffic to some extent. So here in this screenshot, if you have about 6,000 sessions during, this is for a month time frame, um, to your homepage, that's probably where you're going to want to begin testing versus some of these pages further down where maybe you're saying, hey, we don't like the look of this page that has 150 views, but is that really going to be the highest impact? Probably not. Then again, desktop versus mobile. So just a really interesting screenshot to point out how performance can be very different across the two platforms. Um, and we at Ladder and many of our tests will try to consider the two funnels a little bit separately. So for instance, seeing here, if you have two thirds of your traffic on a mobile device with a 0.6% conversion rate versus just a third of your traffic on computers converting much better, you're probably going to want to begin running some tests on that mobile site for starters since you have so much volume there that isn't converting. So next, sort of the fun part, I just want to walk through a few examples for different business types based on some of the actual client tests we've run at Ladder. So I'm going to start with um, B2B lead generation. Um, so in this example, this is one of our clients who are a software company. Um, it's a software product at a high price point sold to software companies. So um, a really sort of high value purchase. And this is one where we said on this landing page, um, it would help. And it, this is one of our big wins for them to move logos of some of their satisfied clients um, above the fold to sort of add social proof. So this, um, also to touch on Sri Khan's point earlier on um, paying attention to what happens above the fold on your site is always going to be super important and it's great to have scroll maps installed um, on any of your pages so you can sort of see how far most people are making it down your site but no matter what it's always good to start by paying attention to where the most of your traffic is going to be um, paying attention which is always above the fold before they scroll down. Another one for lead gen that's really interesting, it's really thinking about the information you're asking a user to submit. So for this client, um, we realized we had landing pages that were requesting a ton of information and we were seeing a lot of drop off um, before completing all of those form fields. This is again to touch on Srikant's point where form analytics can be really useful. Here we saw a 10% uplift in conversion rate by removing some of the pieces that we realized weren't really super crucial to pass on to their sales team. Next, and this is a screenshot from Ladder's own site, um, we realized, you know, we've worked with a lot of really impressive companies and again, sort of similar to that example with Exago, the software company, that sort of social proof can be very valuable, especially with like a higher ticket purchase. So we moved some of these logos up from hidden, they were really far down in our site to just below the call to action button. And this was a, a big win for us with a 65% um, improvement in conversion rate by just highlighting those companies we've worked with. Um, another one, using actual customer reviews can be great if you do have positive reviews. Um, this is a client that puts people in touch with real estate agents and we saw a 17% lift in conversion rate by adding that bar at the bottom with um, the nearly perfect, nearly 300 ratings from a third party site. Okay, next I have some examples for e-commerce. So I just wanted to pull this up again because in any um, multiple stage funnel, you're going to want to pay really close attention to where exactly people are dropping off and really targeting your tests towards those areas. So again, for instance, 
um, not just saying, hey, we have a 0.76% conversion rate, but really saying, hey, 3.6% of users adding to cart seems like the place with the most drop off. So let's begin our tests on the product pages with the goal of getting more ads to cart. So now onto some examples. This one I love for e-commerce, um, adding a dynamic free shipping bar. So free shipping can be a huge motivator to get um, users to purchase um, for e-commerce. And it can also really help to play around with your free shipping threshold to um, attempt to increase your average order value. So this is one where we use a plugin and install that on your site. So especially easy if you're on something like Shopify um, to install a plugin to display how far away a user is from reaching the free, free shipping threshold. And then you can actually have in BWO um, a developer write a simple line of code to either show or hide that bar um, so you can measure the success of the plugin. Another one um, using urgency language. So this was a shoe brand. We had determined we were looking to get more ads of the products to cart. And one of the things that stood out to us while auditing their site was this gray text uh, nearly gone next to most of the sizes, which um, to our minds at Ladder seemed like it might make it appear as though the product was out of stock when in fact it was just using urgency language. So what we tested here um, was showing versus hiding that language. And we actually found that hiding that um, nearly gone text decreased our conversion rate, which was a great learning um, and a great example, I think, of how even a negative test result can have a positive impact. So for a client like this, this is also where having a strong hypothesis and consideration of the potential outcomes of what you're testing can be so valuable. Um, so in this instance, now we know that urgency language is a motivator and we can begin to do things like um, shorter term sales or play with the way we um, advertise that certain things are uh, low in stock. Um, so really great learning even with a negative test result. Another one I love for e-commerce, but that can also work for other types of businesses as well, um, is using social proof. So this is an app called Proof. There's also one called FOMO. Um, and it displays these little notifications that pull from real customer data. So it can say, like in this instance, Deborah recently signed up for proof. You can also trigger them to pull in um, for e-commerce someone's name, location, and product they bought. You can play with different levels of information depending on what you're comfortable with. But we've seen this work really well. Um, and again, similar to the free shipping bar, this is one where you would implement the plugin in your site. And then through BWO, you can either show or hide the plugin in different variants. So you can really, rather than just throwing things on your site without measuring them, um, you can get a clear learning as to whether seeing that actually helped push people to make a purchase or sign up or hurt. Next, a little bit on different devices, since I mentioned this at the top as well desktop versus mobile traffic. So really making sure to always consider optimizing for mobile while you're developing your strategy with a focus on what areas you're seeing drop off on. So for this same shoe brand I pointed out earlier, one of the things we noticed initially was that there was no um, native selection bar. So this was one of our tests was to have um, and if you have a developer on your team, um, you can have someone write a line of code for something as complex as this within BWO to test um, adding in those elements that are going to make your mobile site a little more user friendly. Next, this is one of our biggest wins for this client um, shown earlier also, a real estate agent company. We, when we started working with them, mobile was pretty low converting and there was no mobile optimized dedicated page. So what we did was just take um, that page and create a dedicated mobile experience and start to measure separately from the desktop page and really consider those two different types of traffic. And that was, I think we tripled our conversion rate just by taking that into account and considering the mobile page separately. 
Next to touch on, testing on lower traffic sites. So one of the things that becomes really tricky with um, CRO testing is taking into account how much traffic you're able to drive in a given period of time. Usually I would like to run a test for a month, maybe six weeks. And this is really where I think Srikant's um, point on prioritization comes into play. So if you don't have a ton of volume on your site, you're going to have to be very strategic. You may only be able to run one test at a time over a period of a month. So you really want to pick the right types of testing and then also set realistic metrics for success. So I'm just going to give a fictional example. Um, the screenshot is from one of our previous clients and then the metrics are kind of just imagined for the sake of this example. But say you're running an e-commerce business with 3,000 monthly site sessions, conversion rate of 1%, um, that would mean 30 purchases in a month. Say your add to cart rate is 4% and half of your traffic views a category or collections page. Um, so how are we going to test? What are our goals going to be here? Great way to determine that is to, I'll often do this when coming up with my strategy, input your metrics into BWO statistical significance calculator. And that way you can get a sense of what types of goals you might want to be optimizing towards and what is most realistic. So oftentimes, in this case, for instance, if you are trying to get within your fictional month, 3,000 visitors, a statistically significant result on this test, if you optimize towards purchases, that's going to be a lot harder to achieve. Um, even if you just look at the raw data from 15 to 26 purchases, that's what you would need to see to achieve a statistical significance on a purchase. Um, and that is a 70% uplift on conversion rate. However, if you ran the exact same test but said, like, hey, that's going to be not feasible, um, let's set the goal of driving someone one step deeper into the funnel to the collections or category page, that's going to be a lot more likely to achieve during that month. So this would be just relatively a 6% increase in conversion rate. and it's a lot more likely that you'll be able to get there quicker and conclude your test knowing that you actually had a significant result. Another point on this, um, one idea for uh, lower volume sites is to try just really overhauling your page. So oftentimes to create a really clean A-B test, it's good to change just one element. That's often the recommendation you'll hear, just change one image, one line of copy the call to action button so you really know what's driving that um, uptick or decrease in performance. But sometimes if you're really looking to move the needle, a larger change will have a bigger impact in either direction. So this was one for the same client pointed out earlier where we said, hey, this is a really high value purchase. We had these short landing pages that ended right below what you see here. Um, and we really revamped the entire page and just measured the two separately. And this was one of our bigger wins from them. So sometimes you don't always need to create a, a totally clean A-B test, changing one element. Sometimes changing more and having a more dramatic test can work really well for a site that doesn't have a ton of traffic. So on that note, I think we can turn over to Q&A time. Thanks, Missy. Thanks a lot. Uh, I see some questions coming in, in here. People just keep on, just articulate for a minute and just keep on asking questions. In the meantime, I'll be selfish here and ask my own question. So my question would be to Shrikan. Uh, a lot of people tell me that CRO is like a big investment for emerging businesses. So what is the best way to get other stakeholders in the organization to get, get on board for a CRO platform or maybe, you know, CRO-like activities? Sure, I think it's it's a good question. Uh, we've heard this from a lot of our customers as to how do they get uh, others excited in their organization about CRO. So I think uh, there's no easy solution. The best way would really be that uh, you start small, you start with uh, the low hanging fruits, you start with the, the quick wins, you start with like doing some uh, quick analysis like uh, some of the things that Missy showed on uh, web analytics or uh, some of the tools like say heat maps or uh, recordings they can give you those quick insights which you can present to your team your stakeholders and then you can test those like quick low hanging fruits to like convince them of the roi that's involved in testing and that i have seen as 
been like one of the best ways to uh, get buy in if you are say uh, uh, doing it in a bottom up fashion but if uh, you have a business sponsor within your company who's uh, already seen the benefits of optimization then that that's a entirely different game and it really works well for you brilliant another question here is hasna ask us is the bounce rate the most important metric to use before optimizing a page missy can you answer this for us yeah um i don't know if i would say there's necessarily one standard most important metric um i think if your bounce rate is extraordinarily high um then yes definitely pay attention to that but really it's a combination of looking at all of those things that you'll see in your google analytics data so conversion rate at the end of the day is super important um yeah it's hard to say but definitely good to pay attention to i wouldn't say it's the number one thing okay another question here is joe ask us what if you have a very little traffic to compile data my site has less than 50000 a month oh sorry my my site has less than 50 a month can i optimize based on such little traffic shrikant can you take this up sure i think uh, i'll i'll take a stab at it and then probably also missy can add because she spoke about uh, low traffic websites i think my take is that uh, with traffic as as low as say 50 visitors a month if i got it right i think you're you're probably better off uh, uh, investing in uh, more in like say uh, acquisition of traffic if you have low ticket items or low ticket deals and uh, the other thing that you can really invest in at looking is uh, getting some research tools uh, could be web analytics could be a little bit of heat maps and trying and understanding what is the behavior of these early visitors that you're getting at because at least to me uh, there won't be a lot of ab tests that you could run which would give you uh, statistically significant results but this would be an approach that uh, i would take but missy uh, feel free to add your thoughts yeah one thought i have is that it might make sense for a site like that to drive some paid traffic to your site um in order to give you more visitors to get a statistically significant result. So for instance, Facebook ads tend to be one of the least expensive ad platforms and if you were to run some prospecting ads, you might not need to invest so much in order to then have an AB test where you're really actually going to have enough traffic to get a strong result. So that might be one way to approach that situation. Great. Another question here is Nate ask us I currently have an issue where I'm getting a lot of ads to the cart but very little purchases the screen recording ends right where when the checkout process begins for credit card privacy how can i figure out an issue here maybe okay. shikan can take sure uh, i think uh, uh, you're right probably at that end stage there's not a lot of insights that uh, a session recording could give you but i think uh, there could be uh, other uh, Uh, tools that you could use maybe say an exit intent uh, uh, on the cart when people are trying to exit maybe you ask a question that is there a better way we could uh, help you complete this transaction so this is obviously limited to uh, the website channel but uh, if uh, uh, you have other channels then i would definitely say that uh, uh, follow up through emails in terms of like trying to uh, help people close their abandoned carts that could also definitely help okay miss would you like Another to question? add something yeah um, yeah i mean if you don't have the ability to get that real time data from recording i guess one thing to consider would be just sort of intuitively thinking about it or even walking through your funnel um this is something where uh looking at both desktop and mobile like even just opening your phone and going through your own funnel um especially from add to cart to checkout and seeing if maybe there's something that will really jump out as a bug um other things you could test might be are you offering free shipping is your price point higher than other competitors like that's one place where sort of just intuitively thinking about um what might cause the drop off can be valuable as well okay another question we have is uh, drews ask us touching on statistical significance again is there some type of formula to know how much traffic is required to run multiple tests at the same time 
some sort of best practices for how many tests are appropriate for how many visitors you're getting. Maybe Shreetan can take this up first. Sure. I think uh, uh, definitely there are a lot of uh, calculators. VW provides one. Uh, there are uh, multiple other calculators that can tell you uh, what sort of traffic do you need. Like if you know what sort of conversions you have and what sort of uh, expectations you have in terms of uplift, then there are uh, a lot of calculators out there that can tell you the traffic that's needed. And in terms of the uh, second question that was asked uh, as to how do you run multiple tests, I think Missy would be best place to answer this. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think one thing is definitely starting with the statistical significance calculator. Like if you know you have, in my example, for instance, 3,000 visitors and you're putting in numbers and seeing that you need to drive um, 1,500 to each variant to get a significant result with the likely data points you might see, like then maybe you're only going to want to run that one test for starters. One other thing that I've um, often done is you have multiple funnel steps. You can run um, tests at the same time and not have them interfere with one another. It can get a little bit tricky, but if you keep things really far away from one another in the funnel, um, you're less likely to have the two tests conflicting. So maybe you're running a test, if it's an e-commerce business for instance, maybe there's one test on your home page, changing something in the header, um, and the goal there is driving more people into a category page, and then maybe you're also running a test at the sort of end of your funnel um, on the checkout page. So that can be one way to, to have multiple things live without um, having them get in the way of each other and of having a significant result. Okay. So we have a lot of questions, but we'll take two more. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, basically this one is for you. Beshali asks us, which optimization tool do you use to help your customers win? Um, Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, so Vishali asks us, which optimization tool do you use to help your customers win? This one is for you, Missy. Which tool do we use? Sorry, what, um, can you clarify? We use a lot of different tools. <laughs> She's talking about conversion optimization tools. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say we always recommend VWO for running tests. I think other tools, it would depend on your goals, but some of the ones we use a lot, we'll use Sumo Me often, which you can run exit intents, like pop-ups um, on the site. That's a good one. Otherwise, I would always recommend having Google Analytics installed. Um, I think otherwise, it really depends. Like There are some I touched on in the presentation, if you're running an e-commerce business on something like Shopify, there's a lot of plugins that can be really great, like uh, things like the Dynamic Shipping Bar, which is by an app called Hextum. There's FOMO and Proof are really great ones. But yeah, I think honestly there's a ton of tools out there and some of the standards I recommend are definitely just VWO, Google Analytics, and Sumo Me. And then up from there kind of depends on what you're looking to do. Okay, great. So picking up my last question, yeah. Thomas asks us, should I test data segment based on user portraits, like male, age, demographics, etc.? Shrikant, can you take this up? Yeah, sure. Um, so I feel, uh, personally, in my opinion, I think uh, uh, attributes like demographics are not the best fit for uh, segmenting your users. Uh, what could make more sense is uh, more of behaviors, like could describe anything about their habits, could describe about what they're doing on your website, could describe about uh, what they're doing on other channels. And I've generally seen that uh, tests used with that sort of information really uh, work much better than say the basic level of segmentation which would be uh, attributes like country, male, uh, demographic or salary. So that's why take in terms of uh, trying to personalize segments that you you rather prefer behaviors over uh, attributes or characteristics. Yeah, I would to add would to that like one. to add on that? Yeah, yeah, please do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we have the same thought. Yeah, one thing that I like to do with something like segmentation is to think about the traffic source. So, 
um, someone coming from a Facebook campaign, you will have a sense of their demographics, and then also that might be a slightly different type of audience than someone coming from a Google AdWords campaign. So you can, depending on how much traffic you have, get as granular with source as looking at like even specific um, Google AdWords keywords, what is someone searching? Um, so that can be a good way to consider segmentation. Awesome. Srikanth and Missy, thanks a lot for taking out the time to come out here and share all these information with our audience. Also, thanks a lot all the, to the, all the attendees for attending the session. We will come back super soon with another session on conversion optimization. Till then, keep optimizing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.